This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Amol Takalkar, who is a professor of radiology, nuclear medicine, and molecular imaging at Emory. He's a graduate of uh, BJ Medical College in Pune, India, and began his life in the US in the 90s at the Cardiovascular Research Center at University of Virginia, working on microbubbles with echo contrast. Uh, subsequently, uh, he went to University of Pennsylvania, where he was involved in developing um, and testing attenuation correction strategies for cardiac SPECT and worked with ammonia PET. Um, after that, he moved to Chapota, Louisiana, and was there for about 15 years and continued to focus on molecular imaging and novel tracers, where he served as the medical director at Center for Molecular Imaging and Therapy at the Biomedical Research Foundation of Northwest Louisiana, and was also the associate director for research uh, there at the uh, Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center. His research interests include FDG and using other pet probes in various areas of oncology, cardiology, neurology, and using novel nuclei uh, therapies. He's published several book chapters on cardiac pet and is invited uh, to give talks uh, nationally and internationally, and has served on uh, many leadership positions, uh, various committees. Um, he was the president of the Southwest chapter of the Society of Nuclear Medicine and also very involved with the American College of Nuclear Medicine and the World Congress on Cardiac Imaging and ca Clinical Cardiology. Uh, today, I uh, thank you for being here in person. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about cardiac metabolism using PET, the do's and don'ts, and, and things that we need to know as cardiologists. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Pooja, for that uh, kind introduction and kind words. And good morning, everybody. I see a lot of people are actually online as well. So thank you for uh, spending your Monday morning with me. I hope uh, this is useful. Uh, I was uh, invited to give this talk uh, for based on our uh, previous work here uh, at Emory. So first things first, uh, I don't have any uh, relevant financial disclosures. Uh, Dr. Mehta is not giving me any you know, 10K or anything to give this talk. Uh, I do serve as a consultant uh, for a few uh, radio pharmaceutical and uh, research companies, but none of them have a bearing uh, for this talk. I'm not going to discuss any non-FDA approved products or anything that I'm involved in, in research with for, for this talk. The learning objectives is uh, we'll basically review the applications of a cardiac metabolism PET. So this is going to be not related to perfusion, but metabolism imaging of the heart and then look at uh, how, how to best get the scans based on uh, patient preparations, which is very important for, for this kind of a study. And then look at some scan patterns and, and uh, some other things that we look at when we review uh, these uh, scans uh, for interpretation. So nuclear cardiology has been around for a while and, and it's evolved. Uh, we started with planar cardiac imaging and then we moved on to uh, spec cardiac imaging. SPEC got uh, gradually improved uh, to basically attenuation correction and ECG gating uh, that significantly improved the accuracy of, of PET. We also have MUGAS and then we have uh, positron emission tomography. Uh, actually, the, the applications of positron emission tomography uh, date back quite a lot, even before the oncologic application. So the initial applications of PET were neurology uh, in the late 1970s and 80s. But in the late 80s and early 90s, a lot of work of, uh, with PET and cardiology was done. Uh, but at that time, it was kind of niche. Uh, it was only when uh, FDG became more prevalent for cancer that uh, there was a boom in routine applications of PET and availability of PET scanners in the community. And that gave a renaissance to cardiac PET applications as well, along with oncology and neurological applications. So the focus today is going to be on uh, cardiac PET, uh, specifically metabolism. So we have cardiac PET for perfusion imaging as well that we regularly do here with our rubidium PET generator. So just like SPET, we can have uh, PET perfusion studies uh, with stress. Uh, there are two FDA-approved agents, uh, N30 ammonia and rubidium chloride. Uh, we use rubidium chloride here, so we are restricted to uh, pharmacologic stress, uh, mostly with Lexiscan. Uh, I have the good fortune of having uh, to work with ammonia back uh, at my University of Pennsylvania days in Philadelphia, as well as my previous life in Shreveport, Louisiana, where I had access to a very close bicyclotron. 
And so I've worked with ammonia. And one of the good things I like about ammonia is we could do exercise stress uh, with ammonia in addition to pharmacological stress, which is not a possibility for, for rubidium. But, uh, you know, rubidium works pretty great as well. Uh, but the main topic today is going to be cardiac metabolism imaging, uh, where we generally do a rest perfusion scan, either with PET, uh, preferably with PET, but sometimes we can do it with SPECT as well, and an FDG or some other metabolism scan down the road. Right now, uh, most of it is FDG. And the applications uh, for that are basically for evaluation of myocardial viability, evaluation of SCAR, especially for our EP colleagues when they're trying to uh, ablate uh, a SCAR and uh, for cardiac uh, inflammatory conditions, especially cardiac sarcoidosis. Now, there are some uh, research applications of PET for some other cardiac indications like uh, potentially cardiac amyloidosis, but we're not going to discuss that today. We're just going to stick with the routine, uh, clinically uh, accepted applications of cardiac metabolism PET for now. So cardiac metabolism is a pretty uh, complex uh, entity, uh, and there's a lot of variability. The cardiac myocytes uh, use different kinds of substrates for its metabolic needs. Uh, and predominantly, there is uh, fatty acid uh, and glucose as the two main components, but they vary. There can uh, be other things. Uh, and so we have targets for, for all of this, uh, for fatty acids, uh, for we have C11-based compounds. Uh, the problem with C11 is it's got a short half-life, so it's difficult to use it in, an, in a routine clinical purpose. The good thing is uh, for research entities, uh, you can tag a lot of things with C11 and get a basic understanding and then try to change the tag to F18 or, or gallium-68 or something like that. And then for glucose, we have our good old FDG for glucose metabolism that, that we use a lot uh, routinely as well. So uh, the, the there are different tracers. Uh, as I said, uh, FDG is uh, FDA approved. C11 palmitate and C11 acetate are mostly in the research uh, arena for cardiac uh, metabolism imaging. So myocardial substrate utilization, which is the key uh, principle or, or key pathophysiological basis of all our uh, imaging for cardiac metabolism is a pretty uh, complex entity. And uh, the substrate uh, varies uh, depending on a lot of factors. It, it may depend on what the patient ate uh, the previous night, uh, what the patient's uh, blood glucose and free fatty acid levels in the blood are or uh, what the insulin levels are. So basically it, it is dependent on the hormonal and internal metabolic milieu of the cardiac myocytes uh, at, at any given particular time. So, uh, and, and all my uh, uh, radiology residents know the, my pet peeve and no pun intended for the pet about these normal fasting conditions because I don't know about you guys, but normally I don't like to fast. I So I don't know why we call fasting conditions as normal, but as for the textbooks, uh, under normal fasting conditions, when the glucose levels are low, consequently insulin levels are low and, and free fatty acids are, are moderate to high, the primary uh, myocardial substrate uh, uh, is free fatty acids for, for all its metabolic needs. However, when you eat, your glucose level goes up and consequently insulin levels rise. Uh, insulin drives uh, glucose into the myocytes and uh, also it makes some other signaling changes uh, related to enzymes that favors glucose metabolism in the cardiac myocytes uh, or free fatty acid metabolism. Uh, in that uh, uh, condition, the, the substrate for primary myocardial metabolism changes from free fat, fatty acids to glucose. Uh, irrespective of that, sometimes in uh, ischemic and hypoxic myocardium, again, it might change to, to glucose or free fatty acids as well. So uh, there is a lot of normal variation in cardiac FDG uptake when we do uh, F routine FDG PET scans for oncologic purposes. Now, for oncologic purposes, we don't uh, have a dietary prep that that uh, is attuned to, to look at uh, or get consistent heart uptake. Uh, we usually tell the patient to fast uh, four to six hours. We may tell the patient to fast overnight, uh, but we don't tell the patient to avoid certain kinds of food the day before and those kinds of things. And so uh, normally there is a lot of variation in FDG uptake in the heart, so much so that it can vary from no uptake to intense uptake and all the interim 50 shades of gray in between actually. So these are our different patients uh, uh, showing uh, the, the degree of variability. And at the same time, uh, this is uh, the same patient uh, having serial PET scans for follow-up of cancer. You can see the patient has a head and neck cancer, were treated, had multiple scans. And even in the same patient, uh, there's a lot of variability. Uh, so there is uh, interpatient variability as well as intrapatient variability. You can see that it is pretty intense on this last scan here. 
relatively intense in this first scan and kind of mild to negligible on the interim three scans. So there's there's a lot of variation in in cardiac uptake and uh, of of FDG, and that's a, a big issue uh, when we are doing these scans for for metabolism uh, evaluation. So uh, as I said, uh, we have to control these circumstances, and controlling physiology is much more difficult than than controlling anatomy. And uh, you know, you you basically uh, uh, the scan is so sensitive that even minor changes uh, uh, can cause a, a lot of issues uh, for us, uh, and may actually uh, make the scan uh, uninterpretable. At the same time, the prep may be completely different um, depending on the indication of the scan, and it may really uh, limit us uh, if if the patient does not follow the the right prep as well. So patient preparation, especially dietary prep, uh, is is very important. And uh, sometimes you want to suppress the normal uh, FDG uptake in cardiac myocytes, whereas sometimes you want to actually encourage the normal FDG uptake in cardiac myocytes. And uh, depending on the indication, to to suppress or not to suppress becomes becomes an issue. So let's look at the indications for uh, cardiac metabolism studies. Uh, so we have uh, one of the indications is uh, to evaluate cardiac uh, or myocardial viability, uh, especially in the setting of chronic ischemic heart disease uh, with uh, left ventricular dysfunction, uh, in order to determine whether it's worthwhile to do uh, invasive revascularization uh, and and fine tune management. Now we'll talk about the stitch study a li little bit uh, later down the road that that raised questions about this and and uh, about that as well. Another indication is to uh, you know look for scar. So viability and scar are the the two sides of the same coin. Uh, but uh, in left ventricular arrhythm arrhythmias, you want to map the scar, and I'll show you some examples of the value of it, uh, especially for our EP colleagues uh, down the road. And then uh, to look at myocardial infection or inflammation, especially uh, sarcoidosis uh, is another uh, indication. So since viability and scar are two sides of the same coin, <clears throat> we kind of want to encourage normal myocardial uptake. So if there's no uptake in, in that situation, when there's normal uptake elsewhere, <laughs> it helps us determine whether the myocardium is, is viable or it's a scar. On the other hand, when we are uh, looking at cardiac sarcoidosis, <clears throat> give me a second. We actually want to suppress the normal myocardial uptake so that any uptake you see is pathological uh, and is uh, inflammation. So uh, in these two conditions, the dietary prep is different. In this condition, the dietary prep uh, or, or other patient preparations uh, are different as well. There's some pharmacological interventions as, as well. So uh, what do we do to encourage uh, normal myocardial FDG uptake uh, in the setting when the indication is, is uh, evaluation of viability or SCAR? So you basically want to shift uh, 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 from free fatty acids to glucose as the preferred sub metabolic substrate for cardiac myocytes. So there are uh, dietary preparations where you tell the patient to have a high carb, uh, low fat diet. Uh, you do uh, glucose loading, usually oral, sometimes intravenous if the patient cannot tolerate in, uh, oral glucose. Uh, there is this uh, insulin glycemic clamp method, which is kind of tedious, but has been documented and validated uh, in the literature. And there's this agent called SCPMOX uh, that's uh, uh, available in, in uh, Europe, uh, but it's not easily available here in the U.S., uh, my personal preference is to tell the patient to have a high carb, low fat diet uh, on for, for 24 hours prior to the study and have a high carb, low fat uh, breakfast one hour prior to the scan, uh, check the glucose uh, when the patient comes to the imaging center and if necessary, perform uh, additional oral glucose uh, loading. Now, there are different schemas that are there in the literature. Uh, this one uh, is uh, one of them that basically, uh, uh, so since it's glucose and we want a, a carb diet, uh, the prep is going to be different for diabetic and non-diabetic patients. And here's one schema where they give uh, different amounts of, of glucose. Usually it's a dextrose solution, uh, depending on the blood glucose level and, uh, you know, uh, wait for about 30 minutes to 40 minutes and then give FDG but without with or without insulin kind of a thing. And, and this is uh, another one where uh, most of them uh, do get uh, insulin as well. Uh, and, and that's because insulin promotes uh, glucose uh, uptake by, you know, upgrading uh, GLUT4 receptors and driving glucose and hence FDG uptake in the cardiac myocytes. 
and also making some other signaling changes to enzymes to promote uh, glucose utilization uh, for energy uh, generation. Uh, but, uh, you know, in diabetic patients, uh, the insulin uh, signaling is kind of altered. And, and a lot of these patients where we have to evaluate for viability tend to be uh, diabetic with other chronic conditions. So these are, these are in general, uh, difficult studies uh, to deal with. Uh, this uh, is uh, from our Midtown Hospital. This is their preparation, and they have a, a, a different way of, of, of uh, all of them uh, usually get insulin on a sliding scale. Uh, they calculate uh, the, the blood sugar uh, minus 50 divided by 25 and, and uh, usually don't give more than uh, 10 units of insulin. And, and that's, uh, that's a pretty involved uh, procedure. Uh, my prefer preferential uh, thing is to basically, uh, you know, tell the patient to have the dietary prep uh, the night before. And uh, actually, I don't tell them to fast. I tell them to have a, a breakfast uh, in the morning with, with, so I need to change that slide. Uh, with a um, uh, high carb, low fat diet, uh, check the blood glucose level. If it is less than 150, then, then give uh, 25 to 100 grams of oral glucose, uh, wait for about 30 to 45 minutes or so. And if the blood glucose is around 150 to 175, uh, give them FDG. Uh, in diabetic patients or if the glucose is is more than 200, uh, we don't like to have glucose more than 200 because then there is, uh, you know, internal competition. Endogenous uh, glucose may compete with FDG and, and it may uh, decrease FDG uh, uptake in, in our uh, preferred tissue. So in that case, we give some uh, insulin supplementation along with uh, plus or minus oral glucose. I kind of like to keep the glucose around 150 to 175. Uh, the literature says keep it around 110 to 140. My experience over the past 15 years has been a glucose just above 150 uh, usually drives a lot of uh, FDG into the cardiac myocytes. And uh, about 90% of the time, I've got uh, great scans uh, with, this, uh, with this method by keeping uh, uh, the blood glucose level around 150 or more. Uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, glucose loading itself uh, stimulates endogenous release of insulin by the pancreas, and that would enhance the FDG uptake. So lots of times uh, there is no need to give uh, intravenous insulin uh, unless the patient is severely diabetic and, and has a significantly higher blood glucose level than, than you want uh, kind of a thing. And this has uh, worked with me uh, for, for, for uh, more than a decade uh, without much issues. Uh, there are other methods, as I told you, uh, in patients who cannot uh, tolerate uh, intravenous glucose, uh, you, uh, sorry, oral glucose, you could try uh, intravenous glucose. The euglycemic uh, hyperinsulinemic clamp method, you know, you, you basically have two IVs and uh, with, with one you're giving dextrose, with the other you're giving insulin and tightly monitoring the, the blood glucose level and keeping it at a, at a, at a desired level. Uh, this is kind of uh, cumbersome and difficult to implement in a routine clinical setting, uh, especially in big setups. Uh, You'll, you'll have to have a physician or a nurse uh, on board uh, because lots of times the, the CNMTs uh, are not allowed to give IV insulin uh, at, at big hospital systems. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, in, in diabetic patients, uh, the insulin signaling is, is not that robust and it may not give you the desired effects uh, that you would expect in the non-diabetic patients. As I told you, there's a drug called SCPMOX. Uh, it, it indirectly promotes uh, myocardial glucose uptake uh, and it's a nicotinic acid derivative, but uh, we don't have much experience with it here in the US. At least I don't, it's not easily available uh, in the US, but the Europeans have used it for some time with, with good success. So moving on to the other uh, prep where we actually want to suppress the, the normal myocardial FDG uptake, here uh, the, the prep is, is different. So you, you don't want uh, the, pa the patient's uh, uh, cardiac myocytes to uh, prefer glucose uh, as, the, as the metabolic substrate, but you want them to be like under normal fasting conditions uh, with free fatty acids as the preferred metabolic substrate. In that situation, uh, you, you basically want to have a low blood glucose level at the time of FDG administration. So a prolonged fast has been recommended for up to 18 hours uh, dietary modification. So basically a low carb, high fat, high protein diet uh, for a couple of days prior to the scan. Uh, some people have used intravenous heparin um, at about 50 international units per kg dose. Uh, you know, you give that uh, before giving FDG. 
it activates uh, uh, the, the lipoprotein and hepatic lipases, the enzymes, uh, which increases free fatty acid uh, levels and, and reduces glucose utilization in cardiac myocytes. So uh, again, I uh, don't uh, use much of heparin uh, and a combination of the other uh, of the above may be a better approach that's been documented in the literature as well. Again, my personal preference is to have a, a low carb, high fat diet, uh, high fat, high protein diet for a couple of days prior to the scan, followed by a relatively extended fast. Uh, usually overnight is good enough. Uh, so, you know, after the meal the previous day, uh, if the patient is fasting, and, and during the daytime had a low carb, uh, high fat diet that generally has been uh, good enough. Uh, a lot of times the patients don't know what is a low carb and high fat or low fat and high carb diet. So, uh, you know, that's where our scheduling uh, people are very important. Uh, we used to, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's good for uh, either the, the technologist or the scheduling person to call the patient the uh, day before, a couple of days before and go over uh, or send them information about what you uh, should eat and, and should not eat depending on the indication for the study, uh, because really it's gonna make or break your scan. So it's, it's very, very important. And uh, since in nuclear medicine, we have been dealing with, with diet for other entities, like when we do iodine therapies, we, we tell them to have a low iodine diet. And so we give them uh, paperwork about what's exactly low iodine diet. This was not uh, uh, that big an issue for us to come up with uh, for cardiac things as well. So we we send this and th that that kind of helps uh, reinforce with the patients uh, as well. Uh, and uh, uh, as referring cardiologists, uh, as well as reading cardiologists, some of you read these scans as well. Uh, although at Emory, I think uh, most of this metabolic imaging is read by us. Uh, but uh, if the referring uh, cardiologist uh, emphasizes the patient preparation, uh, patient compliance is better. They, you know, lots of times patients have this mindset that, oh, these doctors just tell us to prep. But last time I went without preparation, they still did the scan and said nothing kind of a thing. Uh, that's okay if you're if you're imaging anatomy, but if you're imaging physiology, uh, you know, patient preparation is extremely important. And I would rather reschedule than give uh, radiation unnecessarily to a patient uh, if I know that the scan is not going to be a, a good scan kind of a thing. So let's talk about uh, the after the prep, uh, the, the indications and, and the scan patterns uh, itself. So let's start with uh, well, viability imaging. So in the in the setting of, of uh, chronic ischemia, which is uh, which is in epidemic proportions here in the US now and, and uh, rising in incidence uh, globally as well, uh, you have a conundrum of findings. You have a spectrum of findings uh, because of the various insults to the myocardium and the myocardial response to it, how it adapts to it, uh, remodels and tries to sustain. And those adaptive responses lead to, you know, various things that we label as either hibernation, stunning, ischemic preconditioning. And, and because of this, you may have a, a dysfunctional myocardium that's that's uh, fully viable, partially viable, or completely non-viable or, or scar. And uh, the we have to find, uh, you know, whether the dysfunctional myocardium is necrosed and scarred, uh, which is non-viable and ha may have different treatment implications or stunned or hibernating, which is viable and may have different treatment implications as well. So in a patient with uh, coronary artery disease uh, of the chronic type with uh, left ventricular dysfunction, uh, you have different uh, uh, treatment uh, options. You have uh, optimal medical management, uh, you have revascularization, or you can put the patient on a list for cardiac transplant. Uh, medical uh, therapy, however, uh, has, has uh, uh, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, adverse events generally compared to, to surgery, but not everybody uh, is a candidate for surgery and can benefit from surgery. Cardiac transplant has limited availability of donor hearts and there are significant uh, periprocedural uh, morbidity associated with, with cardiac transplants as well. And revascularization, uh, basically uh, cabbage uh, has a significant uh, periprocedure morbidity and sometimes mortality as well. So, but it has the maximum benefit uh, in patients uh, technically with, with reversible uh, dysfunctional myocardium or, or viable uh, dysfunctional myocardium. So we want to uh, screen and find out patients who may benefit the most from um, the revascularization procedures to offer them that over uh, uh, medical management. And if, if there's no significant um, viable uh, myocardium that, 
that can change outcomes, then the patient should be, you know, pushed towards optimal medical ma management and maybe placed on a heart transplant list. So there are various ways to look at uh, viability. Uh, you could do stress uh, echo with, with low dose dobutamine. You could do a thallium rest redistribution studies, uh, which uh, some centers may still do, but not a lot. Uh, you can have some uh, uh, technician redistribution studies as well. Again, they're not in vogue. Uh, you can have a PET with uh, perfusion and metabolism imaging. Uh, you have cardiac CT, which is not there yet, but cardiac MR uh, is definitely coming. And, and with hybrid imaging, you can now have a cardiac PET MR as well. Uh, we at Emory are actually fortunate to have a, a, a PET MR machine here on campus. So there are uh, lots of uh, potential, uh, there's a lot of potential for, for other studies down the road kind of a thing. So uh, as of now, the gold standard uh, is, is for myocardial viability imaging at least is PET, although cardiac MR has come a long way and, and neck to neck with, with uh, PET, uh, PET uh, cardiac imaging as well. So uh, you basically uh, can't get a good idea about viability with perfusion alone. If you have a dysfunctional myocardial segment, uh, you can have relatively normal flow um, and, and that could be stunned myocardium. If it's significantly reduced, uh, it's scarred, but indeterminate declines in flow, which uh, is kind of difficult with spec to begin with because of the relative uh, variations when you're looking at relative uptake and how you window things and all that. Uh, it's difficult to quantify SPECT as well as, as PET. Uh, so uh, indeterminate uh, de decline could be either in hibernating or, or necrosed uh, endocardial tissue uh, mixed with relatively normal myocardium. So, you know, assessment of, we believe that assessment of regional flow alone, although important, is, is insufficient for viability evaluation and requires uh, evaluation of metabolism, especially with FDG. So you assess uh, the blood perfusion at rest either with, with uh, SPECT or PET, I kind of prefer PET because the images are, are better and can be quantified uh, better than SPECT. Uh, although newer SPECT, especially with digital cameras, can, can give you pretty good pictures as well. And then assess uh, metabolism with FDG with proper patient dietary prep and, and glucose loading as necessary. Uh, here's a typical uh, 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 protocol for this, uh, you know, dietary prep, glucose loading, uh, you do a rest perfusion scan, and then you give FDG and you do a metabolism scan uh, just of the heart. Uh, you get uh, different patterns based on the perfusion and metabolism imaging. You could have normal blood flow and, and normal metabolism, which is basically normal viable uh, myocardium. You could have decreased blood flow and, and decreased metabolism, which is necrosed or non-viable myocardium. And then you can have uh, decreased blood flow with, with normal or sometimes even increased uh, metabolism because as I said, in hypoxic or ischemic myocardium, again, irrespective of blood glucose level and, and uh, insulin, you may have uh, upregulation and uptake of FDG in that tissue. So that uh, flow metabolism mismatch is considered the hallmark of, of dysfunctional but viable myocardium. And that's what uh, we want to look for when looking for viability. So here is an example. And I think that floating bar kind of takes away a little bit of, uh, of the image here, but if you can see, uh, and that was what I was afraid of. Uh, so there is a, a perfusion deficit here in the apical, uh, apicoseptal portion of the heart on the, the rest perfusion images with preserved metabolism there. And this flow metabolism mismatch is a hallmark of viable myocardium. So this is a 53-year-old male patient with you know, unstable angina at cardiac cat showing a CTO of the proximal LED. Um, and uh, he had Q waves and, and uh, the study was done after the patient was all settled and all that uh, and treated for his uh, MI uh, to, to look at myocardial viability because his uh, function was significantly uh, decreased as well. And uh, you can you can basically do polar plots the same way that you do with a rest and, and a stress uh, perfusion imaging. You have here uh, rest and uh, FDG uh, polar plots and, and uh, you can look at uh, how, how are the defects, how, how reversible or there we look at reversibility here, we look at mismatches uh, and, and uh, you can actually quantify them. Uh, here's another example of a patient, a 61 year old with a STEMI multivessel CAD uh, for myocardial viability. And you can see uh, again uh, here, uh, instead of the top row being stress and the bottom row being rest, we have the top row as perfusion rest and the bottom row as FDG. Uh, and you can see uh, that there uh, there is uh, a defect on both. Uh, however, if you see uh, 
well, uh, there's there's a little bit of mismatch between the the perfusion defect uh, and the metabolism defect, and the perfusion defect is slightly uh, bigger than the the metabolism defect, and you can actually quantify the match and mismatch uh, in percent of myocardium as well as grams. So basically here, the total defect is about 14% or 26 grams of myocardium. 79% of the defect was mismatched, which translates to 11% of the myocardium or 21 grams. And 21% of is uh, it's matched or non-viable. So that, that's 3% of the total myocardium or five. So you can you can quantify and get a lot of uh, information uh, about, about this. Uh, Here's another example kind of uh, showing uh, similar things uh, with, with uh, amount of viability in percent and, and grams of tissue. And uh, so uh, what we found that it kind of uh, helps uh, detecting viability uh, uh, before determining therapy because it, it kind of, if there is a lot of viable myocardium remaining, then it's expected that it's going to predict a better functional recovery, better improvement in, uh, in heart failure symptoms, your better improvement in EFs, exercise capacity, overall quality of life. Uh, there will be less uh, preoperative or perioperative uh, morbidity and, and events and, and better long-term survival, uh, uh, as well as uh, short-term survival if, if you uh, offer uh, and do revascularization in patients with a significant amount of viable myocardium compared to uh, non-viable myocardium. So, uh, so much so that uh, basically if you identify a significant amount of viable myocardium in a defect, then uh, failure to promptly uh, you know, act on it may actually lead to uh, adverse uh, uh, outcomes. And if, if there is not a significant amount of viable myocardium, then maybe those patients are better off with, with optimally uh, 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 manage, management via medical treatment and, and potentially with a heart transplant down the road. Uh, sometimes we could do uh, a rest stress study uh, with FTG, uh, just like you would do a rest stress and, and then uh, a perfusion PET or SPECT and then add on an FDG to it. And you can have uh, different patterns based on the rest stress as well. So you can have a, a fixed defect with a match or mismatch and you have a partially reversible defect with a, with a match and mismatch. And, you know, usually you would not be doing this on a reversible defect because that, that indicates acute ischemia and that, that is a different conundrum uh, that we want to uh, look for. And based on those findings, you could have uh, uh, implications that this is a transmural MI or hibernation or a combination of, of various things happening down the road. Uh, so here's another example of a 64-year-old male with a lot of uh, comorbidities and severely reduced EF and non-STEMI, multi-organ failure, uh, and was referred for uh, a viability study. Uh, in this case, we were not able to do a perfusion, uh, but we just did a metabolism scan. And even that sometimes is useful uh, where we had reduced uptake uh, in the lateral or infilateral wall, uh, you know, basically no significant viability uh, in the area of deficit uh, that kind of helps. So sometimes you may get by without even doing uh, the perfusion scan. So let's talk about uh, the STITCH trial that, that basically put a lot of dampener on, on uh, the workup for viability. So STITCH was a, a trial that, that stands for Surgical Treatment for Ischemic Heart Disease. Uh, it was a randomized uh, multicentral trial where they enrolled uh, patients that I just showed you uh, with documented uh, CAD uh, uh, and LV dysfunction. Uh, the EF was basically less than 35%. And they were randomized to either uh, medical therapy alone or, or medical therapy with uh, cabbage. And the initial study design uh, asked for all patients uh, who are enrolled to have myocardial viability imaging. And so uh, they were basically classified as a, a having either viable myocardium or non-viable myocardium uh, based on predetermined thresholds. And, and based on that, they were basically randomized to receive uh, either medical therapy or uh, medical therapy with cabbage. And surprisingly, uh, they showed that there was no significant um, uh, association between the presence of myocardial viability and, and outcomes um, based on, on cabbage. Uh, and basically the, the presence of myocardial viability had no impact on likelihood of benefit from medical therapy plus cabbage versus medical therapy alone. And it raised uh, serious questions about the utility of myocardial viability in patients with, with uh, coronary artery disease, chronic and NLV dysfunction. So uh, the, the original STITCH trial uh, uh, report uh, does not say much on it, uh, but there was a subset analysis uh, in the same issue of JNM 
uh, or sorry, New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, that, that came up with this. But there are lots of caveats and a lot of limitations uh, to the viability part of the STIS trial. So uh, they they did say they did find that the viable myocardium patients with viable myocardium had had better uh, survival uh, than patients with non-viable myocardium. But there were a number of of limitations with uh, uh, that you should basically uh, take uh, the the results of the subset of viability study for the stitch trial, uh, not just with a pinch of salt, but basically with a fist of salt, I believe. So uh, so. Because of, of issues with enrollment, they had a hard time enrolling patients for the viability. So they made a uh, viability imaging optional uh, for this study. So that led to uh, a lot of, of, of fewer patients uh, compared to the actual stitch trial. Uh, so only a, a, a very small amount of patients who were screened actually met the IE criteria. And of those screened, only a few were actually enrolled uh, for the viability study. And uh, viability imaging was not mandated. It became optional uh, just to you know, complete the trial. And that led to, uh, you know, so basically the STITCH trial had around 1,200 patients, but only about 600 of them had, had viability studies. Uh, so that's half. So the strength is, is pretty low. On, on top of that, uh, because of the binary reads, the number of people with non-viable myocardium were very low, uh, only about 14% uh, or, or, or so, or, or even lesser, uh, or nineteen percent of the total uh, were were with non viable. So there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, underpower uh, uh, of of the number of patients in in the trial. Uh, on top of that, uh, the patients uh, with and without viability were not matched. Uh, they they had significant uh, differences at baseline, and uh, the the techniques for viability were actually suboptimal. So they did not go with FDG PET or or even. Uh, cardiac MR with delayed gadolinium enhancement. So delayed enhancement cardiac MR. They actually went with uh, dobutamine stress echo or SPECT. And both of these are, are known to be inferior to FDG or, or even uh, MR. And then, uh, you know, classification of as, as viable or not is, is uh, not a great thing because the amount of viability or the amount of non-viable myocardium um, extent of, uh, of that is, is pretty important in determining outcomes as well. And uh, they also defined viability in a different way. So they, they went with the segmental model. And as long as uh, 11 of the 17 segments were viable, uh, then they considered the, the, the heart as viable. So basically, if you go uh, in this example here, and if, if these uh, are, are 17 segments, then they would consider this as viable myocardium. Whereas you can see that the culprit area is actually completely non-viable. So this should have been classified as non-viable, but they apparently classified them as viable in the stitch trial. So that's a big, big issue uh, because they did not consider whether the viability was only counted in, in segments also showing contractile dysfunction and less perfusion uh, and not all the segments of, of the 17. Uh, they did not report any data on the contractile dysfunction, and uh, basically they should have excluded uh, the, the, the segments which were normal uh, with perfusion and contractility uh, in their analysis because, you know, improve, they, they are not supposed, if they're functioning normally, how can they improve uh, and contribute to the improvement in symptoms after the treatment kind of a thing. And as I said, the sample size for the non-viable was pretty low, uh, 601 patients uh, for the viability subset compared to 1,212 for the uh, total stitch uh, of that, uh, 114 or 19% were non-viable, whereas 80 were. So again, it's it's a significant underpowering of the non-viable. Uh, so it's going to skew your, uh, your... So basically, I I don't think the stitch trial says anything. Uh, can You can derive any significant conclusions uh, about the value of viability to determine uh, outcomes in, in revascularization. Um, I don't know how many of you changed your practice patterns based on, on stitch trial, but that was quoted a lot uh, by my cardiology colleagues when, when uh, ordering the scans. And, and we, there, there have been uh, you know, rebuttals about this uh, uh, presented in, in the literature for a long time. Uh, so uh, at least in my past life, we did a, still did a significant amount of viability imaging. Uh, we do relatively small amounts of viability imaging here at, at Emory. And I hope uh, you reconsider uh, your practice patterns based on a critical review of the literature, which I think uh, is an art that we need to teach our residents and, and fellows as well. 
So moving on to the, the other side of the coin, which is evaluation of SCAR. So as you can evaluate a uh, viable myocardium, we can also evaluate for SCAR. So where would you want to evaluate the SCAR? So in patients who have ventricular arrhythmias and you're considering um, ablation by our uh, EP colleagues, uh, they have to map out the SCAR using electroanatomic voltages. And uh, I think there you, you can uh, help them by telling them where the scar is beforehand so they can, they can start with that area rather than mapping the whole year, whole uh, left ventricular myocardium. So here's a 54-year-old male with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, persistent rhythm abnormalities and was being considered for ablation. Uh, here, instead of a, a, a PET, we did a SPECT uh, with technetium at rest for perfusion and then... Uh, FDG for metabolism, and you could still uh, evaluate the two in conjunction. And we found a match perfusion uh, abnormality in the, the proximal basal segment here uh, in the lateral inferolateral wall, uh, which matched with the uh, perfusion defect. So that was a scar. And during the EP procedure, they found a scar in the basal postolateral wall using electroanonomical mapping, and they were uh, successfully able to uh, ablate that area. So, so this is uh, basically the electroanatomic map of the same patient's uh, left ventricle, uh, showing different views. Uh, so the pinks are, are, are good. Uh, those are healthy uh, areas of myocardium with voltages more than 1.5 millivolts whereas the red uh, is the scarred area with less than uh, 0.5 millivolt voltages. And within the scar, usually you find an aberrant zone that's causing the, uh, the arrhythmia that needs to be ablated. So uh, basically in, in difficult patients or patients who have significant risk or comorbidities, instead of, of mapping the whole left ventricular myocardium, if you start with the area that you know is a scar based on imaging, uh, you could start mapping there. And if you find the culprit area, you can you can ablate it and decrease your procedural time um, as well as potentially uh, complications. Uh, here's another example of a rest perfusion study with a FDG. You can see almost the entire inferior wall uh, is, is down and that's a, a scar, uh, a big one. You can, you can even quantify it the same way that you could quantify uh, the viable uh, myocardium. And, and this is uh, that patient's uh, electroanatomical map. And you can see how well uh, the, the red matches with the defect that we picked up on, on the SCAR evaluation with FDG metabolism. And again, uh, they were able to successfully uh, find an aberrant zone within the SCAR and um, uh, you know successfully ablate this patient. So uh, we've used a lot of this uh, uh, in my past uh, at uh, in Louisiana with our cardiology EP colleagues, and they found it very useful uh, to ablate so much so that they used to actually ask me, why don't we have something for uh, atrial arrhythmias as well for uh, for ablation? And and I want to make a comment, although I said I'm not going to discuss any research applications. Uh, Dr. Mehta is doing a study that that uh, potentially may have atrial arrhythmia detection capabilities uh, with uh, basically uh, MIBG aid review uh, with, with the high-end spec scanners, so the digital spec scanners. There's some data on that actually as well. So that, that would be good. Uh, sorry, did somebody we'll take a half a pill. Oh, so uh, so please, please mute yourself if you're not uh, talking, please. Um, so moving on to the, the last uh, topic uh, of, uh, of today's discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, cardiac sarcoidosis that, that is of interest uh, not only locally here at Emory, we do a lot of these, but, but uh, across the country and, and globally as well. So sarcoidosis, as we all know, is a, a granulomatous disease. Uh, we still don't know the exact etiology, but uh, we know that it causes non-caseating granulomas. And although uh, involvement of the respiratory system, especially the lungs and, and mediastinum is the most frequent, uh, it does uh, involve almost any organ system. Uh, in, in countries uh, like uh, India, where I trained initially, uh, you know, TB used to be called the greatest mimicker, whereas uh, in the US, uh, sarcoidosis is the greatest mimicker. It can mimic uh, a lot of uh, diseases, including lymphoma. It can... Uh, involve a lot of organs. You can have bone marrow involvement. You can have uh, skin and subcutaneous involvement. You can have parenchymal organ, organ involvement with uh, liver, spleen, uh, even uh, you know, uh, ocular involvement, uh, osseous involvement, uh, and, and heart involvement or cardiac involvement. 
So symptomatic cardiac involvement tends to happen in about 5% uh, of patients with uh, extracardiac uh, sarcoidosis, usually pulmonary. Uh, so asymptomatic involvement is, is more common. And uh, depending on the, the location and extent uh, of the disease in the heart, uh, you can have uh, various types of symptoms. Uh, generally, the patients have some sort of conduction abnormalities, ECG abnormalities. They may have uh, frank arrhythmias uh, or uh, heart failure as well. And patients who do have uh, sarcoidosis with cardiac involvement tend to have a poorer prognosis compared to patients who have sarcoidosis without uh, cardiac involvement. Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to uh, uh, come up with guidelines to uh, e evaluate uh, cardiac sarcoidosis because uh, only about 5% of patients have symptoms. So most of the evaluation becomes kind of screening to help uh, pick up asymptomatic patients and prevent damage and improve their outcomes. So there are a couple of uh, proposed guidelines. A uh, lot of it, a lot of work has done in Japan. So they, they have a set of guidelines and, and also uh, workup algorithms. And we also have some uh, based on our own uh, WASOG criteria. Uh, here is uh, the Heart uh, Rhythm Society's uh, expert consensus uh, where they, they uh, come up with, with different ways. Uh, so they, they basically go with either cardiac MR or, or PET uh, as uh, patients in whom we are suspecting uh, ca cardiac uh, involvement with sarcoidosis. Um, and with uh, cardiac PET, uh, with FDG, you can have either uh, a, a diffusely increased uptake, again, appropriate patient prep, or focal a pattern of increased uptake or focal on diffuse uptake. And uh, you basically uh, uh, most likely are uh, uh, seeing focal uptake more commonly, uh, especially if your patient has, has been prepped uh, appropriately. Uh, but sometimes you see focal and diffuse uptake as, as well. And uh, we like to do these scans uh, in concurrence with perfusion because sometimes there are perfusion uh, uh, deficits as well. And the perfusion deficits uh, with time may become worse actually, and that may give you an idea about uh, the progression um, of the disease. And uh, the FDG metabolism portion gives you about the amount of active inflammation going on. So that can actually help with uh, assessment of, of response or intervention uh, in the interim on serial scans. And uh, basically, uh, so who do we screen for? It's uh, patients who have a biopsy proven extra cardiac sar sarcoid. Uh, with uh, suspicious uh, uh, cardiac findings, uh, either an abnormal ECG or an abnormal echo, uh, and in a relatively younger patient, so middle age to uh, early older age, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, or, or even younger patients, if you have these kinds of things, uh, because uh, you know at least in the South uh, here in the U.S., uh, sarcoidosis is almost in uh, endemic proportion. So we we pick up a lot of unsuspected sarcoidosis on our oncological imaging as well, so much so that it, it um, decreases our uh, specificity for calling uh, metastatic nodes uh, in the chest uh, a lot of times. Um, so again, there are uh, other uh, uh, expert consensus where uh, they re recommend uh, having an advanced cardiac imaging center with capabilities to do these scans well, either cardiac MR or, or FDG PET. All these were in the era of uh, before hybrid imaging with PET MR. So now we have cardiac PET MR uh, and, and that can open up more avenues um, for us. Uh, and again, uh, that's been uh, shown by, by different groups. Uh, here are some indications uh, for screening, and, and they also recommend uh, uh, what to use for screening, CMR or, or PET, or sometimes an invasive electrophysiologic study, and, uh, you know, yet relatively younger patients with, with heart blocks or unexplained uh, arrhythmias and abnormal ECGs and all that. A similar protocol uh, that we use, except that the, the PrEP is different. So here you want to suppress the normal uh, FDG uptake. So you want a low carb, uh, high fat diet, promote fatty acid. And so anything that, that lights up would be abnormal uh, in this case. Uh, the schema for interpretation is uh, slightly different. Uh, so there are two uh, proposed uh, schemes. Uh, this is one where they, uh, they consider abnormalities uh, in perfusion and or metabolism. So you can have uh, this as category one where there's normal uh, perfusion and, and this is appropriately suppressed uh, metabolism because of the patient prep. Uh, this one would be considered normal as well because this is normal perfusion and this is like normal FDG. So the patient basically did not follow the dietary prep. Uh, 
uh, I mean, for patient to have this much sarcoid, the patient should be significantly uh, symptomatic. At the same time, you, you would expect at least some perfusion abnormalities in if you have so much active sarcoid. So this would be considered uh, a failure of, of preparation and you wouldn't call this as florid sarcoidosis uh, kind of a thing. Then you can have a uh, either abnormal perfusion or abnormal metabolism, but not both. So here the perfusion is normal, the metabolism is abnormal. Uh, and here the perfusion is abnormal, but the metabolism is normal. And then you can have abnormal perfusion and metabolism with this category three, where you have a perfusion defect and a matching uh, increased metabolism in that area with suppressed uh, uh, FDG uptake or suppressed FDG metabolism elsewhere. So this is pathological, this is active sarcoid with, with a corresponding uh, perfusion defect uh, kind of a thing. Uh, and here it's in the septal wall, here uh, is in the anterior and, and lateral wall kind of a thing. Um, I kind of prefer this scheme of interpretation over the prior one. Uh, so this one is, is kind of similar. Uh, you have normal, very, you have normal perfusion and suppressed uh, metabolism. Uh, then in early progressive and moderate uh, to severe uh, sarcoidosis, you start getting uh, increased uh, FDG uptake with suppression of rest of the normal uh, myocardium. And initially you may have no perfusion abnormalities, but then you have gradually worsening perfusion abnormalities. And then some say uh, in very late stages, uh, it, it almost becomes a fibrosis. So you'll have a significant perfusion abnormalities and almost like a suppressed uh, uptake again. Uh, this is my personal preference to interpret the scan uh, over this schema. Again, people may have uh, different ways of, of interpreting. Uh, here are some examples. Here is a 47 year old female with uh, impaired left ventricular function, decreased EF and a left bundle branch block uh, being evaluated for cardiac sarcoid. And uh, you can see uh, that this patient has uh, increased uptake in the lateral wall with suppressed uptake elsewhere of FDG. Uh, usually the lateral wall has more robust perfusion compared to the septum. So if you do absolute quantification, you could actually find that there was a decreased perfusion, a very early, very mild decreased perfusion. So this would be uh, potentially early uh, sarcoid. Uh, in this case, uh, he, the patient also had a, a lung nodule and they did a, a bronchoscopic uh, biopsy and that was uh, that was found to have non-caseating granuloma. So the patient was found to have an extra cardiac sarcoid as well. Lots of times we throw in a, a whole body FDG PET scan uh, in these patients to see other sites of active sarcoids. Um, here at Emory, we do it only in patients who do not have a confirmed diagnosis, uh, biopsy confirmed diagnosis of extra cardiac sarcoid. But in my opinion, I think we should do it in almost every patient just to see how the disease activity is uh, uh, elsewhere, whether there's any active sarcoid going on elsewhere that may have some treatment implications as well. Here's another patient, 48 year old with a history of confirmed extra cardiac sarcoid with cardiomyopathy and decreased uh, LVEF. And uh, you have a spec perfusion uh, as well as uh, FDG metabolism. And you can see that this one is, is completely negative. There's, there are no areas of increased uptake uh, or, and the perfusion is relatively normal. So this patient did not have uh, active cardiac sarcoid at that time. Now we don't know uh, what's the, the negative. So if you have a, a normal uh, perfusion uh, stress uh, spec or PET, you almost have a one year guarantee that the patient uh, may not have, will probably not have any acute cardiac events in the, in the upcoming year after that. We don't know in a patient with, with biopsy proven extra cardiac sarcoid, uh, how long this negative thing will last. So if, if the patient's symptoms worsen in six months or so, uh, if you do a repeat scan, there have been cases in the literature that, that have showed that the patient scan has now converted to positive kind of a thing. So uh, we don't know how uh, what's the warranty of, of this scan, like we have a warranty for the perfusion spectre or PET kind of a thing. Uh, that patient did have a uh, florid, uh, uh, classical uh, lambda pattern or, or, or Christmas tree pattern, kind of a lymphadenopathy in the mediastinum, bilateral hilar and central mediastinal nodes, uh, some other nodes as well. Uh, this patient actually had some bone marrow lesions that were biopsied and showed uh, to be uh, non-caseating granulomas as well. Another very young patient, 27-year-old male, morbidly obese, uh, 
for concern for cardiac sarcoid. And you can see how there are some subtle findings here uh, in the apex um, and the proximal uh, inferolateral wall. There are areas of increased uptake. Uh, there's some matching perfusion abnormalities, especially in the apex. So, so this one was uh, true positive. Uh, for sarcoid, uh, we see a lot of those uh, subtle findings. Uh, bear in mind, if you're doing uh, ammonia perfusion, there has been some lateral wall heterogeneity. So, so be, be careful when you're interpreting perfusion abnormalities in that. Uh, this is an example of cardiac MR and PET in the same patient. So with MR, you can, you can have uh, uh, late uh, gadolinium enhancement, uh, which you're seeing here. Uh, in some areas uh, of, of uh, enhancement in the uh, left ventricular myocardium here, uh, these areas. And then we have a corresponding PET uh, showing the same thing, uh, matching areas of uh, increased uh, FDG uptake. Uh, this was done without the, the rest perfusion imaging, uh, but you can see that it's kind of matching. And if you're more used to uh, the, the transaxials uh, fuse, these are the fused transaxials uh, showing areas of increased uptake uh, that corresponding to the gadolinium enhancement as well. So this was positive for, for active uh, sarcoid. Uh, so here are some examples of assessing response. Uh, this is from the literature. Uh, uh, I think it, it came from uh, Japan. This is the baseline scan. And you can see that there is a septal perfusion abnormality with matching increased uh, FDG metabolism with suppressed metabolism elsewhere at baseline confirming active sarcoid. And this is uh, six months of treatment with high dose steroids. You can see that uh, the perfusion defect has actually improved, not completely gone, uh, but the uptake has completely gone on FDG. So there's no active uh, inflammation going on uh, on this. Uh, here is uh, one of our cases. Um, this is baseline scan. You can see that uh, there are perfusion defects and corresponding areas of increased FDG uptake. Uh, here in the inferolateral wall and apical portion uh, with perfusion defects as well. Uh, this is at baseline and four months later uh, on treatment, you can see that the perfusion defects are improving, although the inferolateral wall is still there, uh, but the FDG metabolism has, has gone. Uh, there was, there have been a few cases uh, where we haven't seen a significant improvement. Uh, we're still grappling with exactly how to quantify uh, and come up with parameters to assess uh, sarcoid. So here are uh, some uh, papers on it, uh, this paper, and I would thank Dr. Mankayo for sending us these papers. Uh, here is an example uh, of, of uh, this paper. They say that they did not find SUV uh, to be that important, but they came up with a, a unique parameter called COV or coefficient of variation which is calculated by the basically the mean uh, segmental uh, standard deviation in each of the segment for FDG uptake divided by the average of each segmental mean. Um, and uh, that was found to have prognostic uh, uh, in, uh, importance. Uh, the extent and severity of the perfusion defects were also prognostically important, uh, but the, the SUV by itself, uh, they did not find uh, it that useful. However, there's uh, another paper here that actually tells, the, and, and the joint uh, statement by SNMI and ASNAC uh, actually recommend using SUV max to assess severity as well as the mean uptake volume. Uh, they, they use a acronym TCMA for that. Uh, to evaluate disease uh, extent. And there's some literature that shows a drop in uh, an SUV by 10 uh, correlates with a mean improvement in LV uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of about approximately 8% in steroid treated patients. I don't, I haven't seen much of this. And the reason is uh, uh, the SUV can be affected by a lot of things. Um, in in uh, there's literature that shows even within institutions it can uh, the SUV can vary uh, inside an institution by up to 18 percent. So generally for cancer we like to have uh, 25 or, or 30 at least 25 percent change. Uh, here they recommend uh, a 20 percent or greater change in SUV max or TCMA uh, in the same direction to be likely significant. Bear in mind that you, you require a lot of standardization for that, uh, standardized dietary prep, uh, standardized dosing, which I don't think we do because we don't do weight-based dosing, and standardized interval between uh, injection and imaging uh, of 60 minutes kind of a thing. So uh, with that, uh, I uh, so this is a lot of work in progress. Actually, if there's a fellow who's interested, we could look at uh, COVs of our of our own patients retrospectively. We could see uh, if uh, we can calculate the TCMA and and see uh, SUV max uh, pre and post and and see how it correlates with patient treatment. It would be an easy study to do. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, I think I am finishing uh, just in time. I would like to acknowledge uh, my current and previous uh, co-workers. So the faculty um, and, and staff uh, in radiology and nuclear medicine and cardiology here at Emory, uh, uh, faculty and staff at my prior uh, LSU Shreveport and, and Pet Imaging Center at Biomedical Research Foundation, where I trained the University of Pennsylvania. I had great uh, nuclear cardiologists to work with, Ammonia there as well. And uh, as, as Dr. Mehta alluded, I began my life at, at what we at that time called the Mecca of cardiovascular research at UVA with, with Dr. Call. Uh, working on contrast echocardiography. That's where actually I got exposed to nuclear medicine slash nuclear cardiology. We were doing MIBG scans in canines. So I'd like to thank for, for all their help uh, in shaping my career. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you so much. That was great. You know, one thing I was struck by was just the variability in normal in the same person mm -hmm. imaged on different days, how variable the FDG. So it sounds like, you know, the prep is so very important. Yes. And I just wonder whether, you know, it's easier when somebody's in the hospital with trying to control their glucose and things, how good do you think that these actually are? I mean, do you think that patients really are following the diet that they're instructed to? So it depends on your patient population. If you have a highly engaged and educated patient population, uh, then yes, they, they stick to the diet. Uh, but if you have uh, patients who have difficulty making ends meet and putting food on the table, obviously they're going to have a hard time following the diet kind of a thing. Uh, but in general, um, what we found that when we tell the patient the importance of this, uh, they have been generally engaged in, and, they, and they do follow the patient preparation, the diet preparation. But, but the communication, clearly telling them why it's important is very important. And from multiple sources. So if the referring cardiologist tells them, then we tell them or our, our tech or the scheduling person tells them, it, it, it actually uh, drives home the point. So for viability imaging, you know, if, if the diet is so important with the pet, do you think that the MR is the way to go because it doesn't require that or? So there's, there's always a trade-off, right? Uh, a lot of uh, MR cannot be done with devices in place. Patients cannot tolerate uh, MR because of claustrophobia and other things. So we've had a lot of patients who got referred uh, for viability because they could not uh, tolerate MR. Uh, plus, there's a big backlog for MR as well. I mean, there's, there's, we are getting a backlog for cardiac pets as well now. But uh, in general, it, it, it's, it's, nothing is 100% in life. So we've, we've, we both have its pros and cons. And, you know, I assume that there's a certain pattern, you know, with the sarcoidosis when you see it's because FDG, FDG is being taken up. So it's indicating inflammation. Mm -hmm. So your most likely is sarcoid just because we're in the Southeast. But what else is I'm just curious, what else is in the differential besides sarcoid? So if you have uh, some sort of other inflammation or infection like myocarditis, uh, kind of a picture that can cause uh, um uh, increased uptake in, in myocardium as well. Um, so you, you have to have a good, good history and, and we do uh, FDG for, for cardiac, uh, infection imaging as well. Uh, it's mostly done for, uh, prosthetic, uh, infection device infection that has been implanted uh, in the heart, like prosthetic valves and those kinds of things. Uh, but sometimes we've done it for, uh, myocarditis and, and vegetations as well. Uh, again, uh, there is a pros and cons, like if, if uh, a valve has been recently implanted, so we, we don't like to do the scan within the first three months of implanting the device uh, it or valve, it, it has to be off because there can be inflammation by the process of implanting itself, so that can cause a false positive. Uh, but that, that's kind of the, the differential. Uh, and some, sometimes, you know, we can have metastatic disease or tumors involving the heart that may show increased uptake as well. So we, we have had biopsy proven cases of cardiac metastasis as well that can show increased uptake. If there are no other questions, um, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you everyone for joining and don't forget to get your CME credit. I'll see you next week. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.